Hey everybody, Jeff here and continuing on in our investigation of the Champlain Tower South condo collapse in Surfside, Florida. Today we're looking at what they are looking for for attorney's fees, which we knew is going to eventually come. It says here, motion for final approval of class settlement and application award of attorney's fees. So this was filed yesterday. They're really asking for two things here because see right here it says motion for a final approval of the class action settlement and application for award of attorney's fees. So they're not likely to get these attorney's fees until there is the approval of that $1 billion plus settlement. So if you remember, we showed you that video two weeks ago. I uploaded that video and I showed you the breakdown of all of the different defendants from both the Champlain Tower side and the 87 Park side of things. That's the condo next door. And also a whole bunch of other defendants. And I showed you that spreadsheet. Now my spreadsheet differs a little bit here from what they're showing as the final. Here they are saying it was approximately a $1.021 billion settlement. But yet when you look at my spreadsheet, I end up with about 1.004. It's pretty close. You know, you're talking within 10, 20 million. My spreadsheet also includes the sale of the property right here at 120 million as the total amount raised. So with the sale, I'm at 1.124 billion dollars as the amount of money that's part of the settlement. This was the spreadsheet you remember I showed you that I created, but this is look at this, it's a 400 page document, folks. So we're going to spend the next seven and a half hours here uh, going line by line. <laughs> no, we're not. This thing is a snooze fest for the most of you. So I'm just going to bottom line what they're saying in here and look at the justifications for what they're asking for. What they're doing here is that they're kind of trying to build the relevant background. And so they're starting off with the building collapsed, talking about how the litigation was filed. There was three different amended class actions. Uh, then they talked about the settlement negotiation. So in January, the judge ordered everybody to go into arbitration. And that's what they did here. And here it was talking about the, how the different plaintiffs mediated, like with Becker and Polyakoff, that was the lawyer for the Champlain Tower South Condo HOA Association. And then I mentioned that this other mediator, Bruce Greer, he met with Morbido and they ironed out the settlements there. And then they go on here to summarize how the settlement was done. And we covered most of this in the last video. This is all of the, the different settling parties, whether they are defendants or not. Okay, so now he's starting to kind of um, justify things like here, the complexity and duration of the litigation, how much work has been put into it so far by attorneys and how things were, were done very quickly. So then they go on here to tell the court that they should confirm the appointment of these class representative lawyers. So these are all of the different lawyers that got involved. And you can see it's quite a big list of them here. Okay, now back in July, the judge fired a shot across the bow of the attorneys. You see, because I want the lawyers who wish to have a leadership role in the case to think about whether any of the firms in this case are, and they're amongst the most successful mass tort class action firms in our community, would they be here it is right here, would they be willing to assume this representation on behalf of these victims on a pro bono basis? Would the provision, right, that the court would have the discretion at the conclusion of the case, if counsel is successful in securing a common fund through their efforts to award a reasonable fee in the court's discretion? 19 attorneys rose to that occasion and the following day they confirmed to the court their willingness to undertake the representation on these terms with absolutely, it says it right here, no no assurance of payment or legal entitlement to any fees whatsoever. So they basically, they took a gamble. They were hoping that they would get into this and that they would be able to get a decent settlement. Nobody knew that the settlement would balloon up to a billion dollars and so fast without a whole lot of resistance. And then it says here, look at this. The court, however, has the right and the discretion to avoid reasonable compensation based on the results achieved. Let's say they only got like 10 million in the settlement. How much do you think the court would have given them then? Probably nothing. So to prevent overbilling and uh, inflated costs and stuff like that, uh, the judge had these uh, lawyers all agree to serve without legal entitlement. Part of this deal was that the judge wanted the class counsel right here to avoid duplication of efforts and work efficiently and cautioned that only reasonable time spent on work authorized and assigned a co-chair and lead counsel and all of them. That way, everything has to be handled through them and you don't have a whole bunch of lawyers running around just adding up hours and stuff like that for no reason. It's kind of like in that movie, The Firm, you know, where Tom Cruise was warned by his client that you guys are overbilling us. Um, so then they 
they go on to talk about the initial efforts of the attorneys and what all they had to go through, uh, paying the experts and doing the expert investigations, um, the discovery efforts, people that they had to interview. They had to develop the legal theories and the pleadings. Here, they also went into extensive mediation efforts. And a lot of it started like in December. So they went through hit shows here, December, January, and February. You can see here, we had the first settlement on February 10th. And then I showed you the other slide I made, which showed that the next few settlements broke through here on March 8th. And then, of course, on May 28th, it, it all ended up here being over $1 billion. Then there's all the administration work afterwards, getting the final approval. And, you know, that's a lot of work. That doesn't just happen overnight. There's a lot of hours that get put into that by a lot of pretty high-priced lawyers. And then what he's doing here, see this this Kuhn line factors? That's a justification to show that the way that they're going to arrive at these numbers that they're asking for has already been precedented by numerous other similar court cases. And this here is really summarizes some of the justification here. The time and labor required, the novelty of the litigation here. This is such a rare type of a case. The complexity and difficulty of the questions involved and the skill. Now, this has some interesting terminology here. It says the court should award class counsel's lodestar with a contingency fee multiplier. So what a lodestar is, sort of what they do here in Florida as a method of determining how much to pay attorney. And that's where they just simply go by the number of hours that were worked on the project and then they want to take this fee multiplier and multiply it by that number whatever it turns out to be okay so what they started off with here was this number here that says 24 million dollars and they reduced it by two and a half million dollars based on the opinion of mr frieden okay down to about like 22.2 million so, and then this is based on their actual reasonable load star enhanced by an appropriate contingency fee multiplier. So they were talking about in a similar case, the court had applied a multiplier of five to a load star here, the, the hourly amount for some similar case. And so that's what they're using here as the basis. So here's the core of how they came up with it, the rest of it then is that it's, they were saying here, it's easy to imagine that traditional fees, like in other cases, would have been 40%, 30%, 20% rates, which means that the lawyer's fees could have easily soared to $300 million. And so what, what the, they're giving the opinion to the court, their load star of $24 million reduced by $2.5 million, but then enhanced by a multiplier of 4.5, see? So like I said, they were probably going to go in uh, lower, which would make the judge, I think, quicker to approve it instead of the normal 5 multiplier that they normally use. So it says here, accordingly, the, the court should award the class counsel their load star enhanced by a contingency risk multiplier in the range of 4.5 times the lodestar. Now here you can see they're also asking for costs and expenses that should be granted. And that was approximately $150,000. One of the attorneys gave some insight into some of the work they had to, to go through. And he says here, since they were told to go into mediation, once they went into mediation, you can see he says, to say that this negotiation was hard fought from beginning to end is an understatement. I've been involved with many settlement negotiations over 45 years of practicing law, but none of them can compare to this one. Negotiations went down to the wire with some of the largest settlements being reached in the 48 hours prior to announcing the settlement to the court. Yeah, and then right here, he's talking on the next page here about, remember how I mentioned they had that 200-page that document there? And here you go. It says, memorializing it in a 72-page master settlement agreement with more than 100 pages of exhibits was itself a mammoth undertaking. So much so that plaintiffs were ready to, but ultimately did not need to file a motion to enforce the settlement. So what happened here is now this is their Exhibit A, and this is the time report. Here's the total hours spent on it by all of the different attorneys and what their lodestar ends up being. In case you're wondering why they reduced the lawyer's lodestar by this two and a half million, the answer is right here. He says he did find that some of the time spent on client interaction was more than necessary. Thus, I have reduced the number of hours by 3,500 hours. That's close to half the total submitted. Accordingly, I would recommend a reduction of those hours 
at a melted rate of $715 an hour. Oof, I definitely got into the wrong business. People working at Walmart are making 15 bucks an hour, and these some of these attorneys are making even more than the 715 an hour. Holy cow. Now here he's talking about how he arrived at that recommended multiplier because he said, like I mentioned earlier, that here in Florida, we, you know, we usually do like up to five as the multiplier. But he says, given that this litigation is among the most difficult, complex, and high profile that he's witnessed in his 53 years of practicing law, he's of the opinion that the, right here, this is it, he's of the opinion that the multiplier are 4.5 times the load star is appropriate here. A multiplier at this high end is sufficient to alleviate the contingency risk factor involved and attract high-level counsel to common fund cases. So the reason why this document was 400 pages was because each law firm had to submit their resume, you know, who was working on the case, how many hours they were working on it, what they did, and yes, of course, submit their final amounts. And all of those had to be added together. Now, take a look at this here. This shows how some of these attorneys really earned their money here, because look at this. So Mr. Goodman was one of the attorneys who um, elicited admissions that were utterly devastating to the 87 Park defendants. So this includes when he deposed Garfield Ray, who was the lead geotechnical engineer on the project, whose testimony buried the other defendants for not following his warnings. Uh, I guess those were the warnings about the that they were exceeding the vibration measurements, the allowable vibration. And then here, the deposition of NV5 senior executive Eric Stern, who, who utterly broke down at his deposition and admitted fault on behalf of NV5. And then, of course, we all know about this guy with that famous report or email, I forget what it was that he had sent out, but but this report that this guy had put out had pretty much guaranteed punitive damages against the contractor, John Mori Moriarty, which, as you can see here on my spreadsheet, he forked over $157 million as part of the settlement. So, yes, yeah, some of these attorneys here for sure um, really earned their keep. And, of course, the court document goes on to name numerous other attorneys. Okay, now check this out. I definitely got into the wrong business. I should have become a lawyer. Because look at some of these customary hourly fees these guys are charging. 1500 So we're talking 500 to 1500 bucks an hour. It says here, but no attorney has submitted a billable rate higher than $1,000 per hour in this case. Holy cow. I would kill to earn that kind of money, folks. And then when you look on page 51 of the filing, you can see here they're asking also for a total amount of approximately $150,000 for expenses that were incurred. Now, ironically, this filing doesn't specify the exact amount they're looking for. You, The judge has to figure this out for himself. So let's do it for him. They itemized in there that the gross attorney Lodestar fees right here are $24.7 million. And then Mr. Frieden, who was a judge, brought in to examine all of the numbers and propose a fair settlement amount to the court. He said he wanted to reduce this by $2.5 million because he felt there was excessive billing going on because they were spending too much time on the phone with clients. So that reduces your total Lodestar fee here to 22.2 million and then you take your multiplier which he came up with also mr frieden and you multiply it by 4.5 which is on the higher end because here in the state of florida sometimes they go as high as five for the multiplier so then you take your 22 million and multiply it by 4.5 and you come up with 100 million ninety two thousand seven hundred eighty seven dollars and 88 cents and would you like to round that up for education sir so here is your subtotal of the attorney's fees now they there was also $150,000 in expenses. So that brings your total up to $100,242,787.88. Cha-ching! I knew I went into the wrong business, folks. 10% of that massive settlement. Holy cow. So I know a lot of you had been asking me since we showed that update a couple of weeks ago on the $1 billion settlement. Well, how much are the lawyers going to get? You know, this is pretty good. Uh, you know, 10% is not that bad to have to give away. I know like with the car accidents and stuff, when you hear those 411 pain commercials and stuff like that on the radio, those guys, they're hoping for a quick $10,000 settlement from the insurance company for you. And they take one third of the amount. 
account. So they're taking 30%, the accident attorneys. You, you'll end up with 6,500 and they'll end up with 3,500 at the end of the day. Look at how fast uh, negotiated some incredible settlements and, and got these people much more money than anybody thought they would ever get. So that takes the another mystery out of it. All we have to do now is sit back and wait for the judge to approve it or disprove it. So anyway, thank you for joining us on this video, folks. And stay tuned because, you know, we always have more to come on this subject here on the Champlain Towers condo collapse. So you folks have a great week and we'll see you on the next one.